Good evening, and thank you for tuning in. On behalf of all of us at the locally based, independently owned bookstore, Books on Books in Miami, Florida, and in partnership with Book Passage in Corte Madera, California, Oblong Books in Rhinebeck, New York, Seminary Co-op in Chicago, Illinois, and the Miami Book Fair, it's my pleasure to welcome you to a virtual evening with Thomas E. Ricks to discuss his new book, Waging a Good War, a Military History of the Civil Rights Movement, 1954 to 1968 published by our friends at Farrar, Strauss, and Giroux. Thomas E. Ricks is the author of multiple best-selling books, including First Principles, The Generals, and Fiasco, which was a number one New York Times bestseller and a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. A member of two Pulitzer Prize winning teams in his years at the Washington Post and the Wall Street Journal, he has been called the Dean of Military Correspondence. And we have David J. Dennis Jr., as a special guest and moderator for the evening. Dennis is a senior writer at The Undefeated. His work has been featured in Atlanta Magazine, The Atlantic, The Washington Post, and The Huffington Post, among other publications. Dennis is the recipient of the 2021 American Mosaic Journalism Prize and is a National Association of Black Journalists Salute to Excellence Award winner. He was also named one of the Roots 100 Most Influential African Americans of 2020. Just a quick reminder that throughout this evening's broadcast, you can post questions below in the Ask a Question feature at the bottom of the screen. I encourage you to support Thomas E. Ricks and Books on Books, as well as our independent bookstore partners, and order your copy of Waging a Good War today from the link at the bottom of your screen. And now, without further ado, I'd like to welcome our guests to the virtual stage. Thank you. Uh Dave, shall we, David, shall we kick this off? Yeah, let's get to it. Uh, thank you guys all for, for having me. Thank you, uh, Tom, for sort of for inviting me to do this, for being part of this. I'm uh, honored to be among uh, a prestigious journalist, award-winning journalist guy, uh, and, and, you know, your books have been amazing. This book is no no different. I mean, I, um, you know, when you sent it to me, it took me a long time to read this book not and that's usually a bad thing but not that not in this case at all it took me so long because i just kept you know there was so much information so much uh in-depth writing reporting so many connections and things that were sort of just blowing my mind and i had to um sit with it you know and really really sit with it and go through even more uh, YouTube and book rabbit holes and all kinds of things to get to get. Um, there are so many just fascinating offshoots with it. And the thing that, you know, and we'll talk about a little bit that's so beautiful about this. There's so many humanizing elements to it. There's so many um, just beautiful connections that you make and ways that we reframe and rethink things. It's more than just history. It is a, uh, really important text about the way that we should consider uh the important movements of, of our lives and sort of the defining battlefields that have determined where we where we are and where we're going so thank you for writing this book i mean everybody you know click the link and and, and, and get it for sure well thank you now i can die happy because sure. <laughs> that is exactly what i was trying to do with this book tell these wonderful stories of these courageous human beings who through great discipline and dignity changed America in a relatively short amount of time. Mm -hmm. They improved America. They made it a better place. Far from perfect, but much better. Uh, I want to say I reread your book in the over the last week. I read it right when it came out. I was rereading it kind of at my leisure on plane rides. And I'm really struck on the second reading by how similar your mm -hmm. book is to my book. Uh, your book is kind of a memoir, a look from the inside. Right. I'm way outside at 30,000 feet. Mm -hmm. But again and again, we are seeing the same things, the same pain that your father felt, mm -hmm. uh, the amount of human energy that was consumed in achieving these goals, uh, down to even the tiniest eerie details. The fact that your father's story begins in Shreveport, Louisiana. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The first page of my book talks about Shreveport right. after the Civil War. Mm -hmm. 
of military aged black males in the Shreveport area were murdered in the 10 years after the Civil War. Right. In many ways, that's when the real war went on, mm-hmm. when uh, white supremacy grabbed back power uh, through a, a, a vicious war that went on really for decades. So first of all, the similarity between our two books just kind of stunned me. Uh, we both, I think, tried to erect lighthouses. You actually mm-hmm. used that term. Right. I constantly thought when I was writing of trying to illuminate the mm-hmm. civil rights movement in a new way, to cast a beam using my background as a war correspondent, to look at this in military terms, uh, frequently because that term would jump to mind. Uh, when I was reading about the movement, doing research, I'd say, well, Montgomery bus boycott, that's a siege of a city that mm-hmm. lasts for over a year. Uh, coming down the Edmund Pettus Bridge at Selma, that's a frontal assault. Mm-hmm. The Freedom Rides, that's a ride behind enemy lines. Uh, so I found your whole story quite moving and kind of thought this is if you took one person in the movement and kind of said, well, when you read Rick's book, what do you think? Hey, David Dennis did it. Uh, <laughs> the story of the Apple Green Pontiac, just one example. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was just so visual. I could see the movie as I was mm-hmm. reading it. I think that's part of a sign of good writing. Uh, a few specific points. I loved the looks at specific people. Uh, Medgar Evers, Fannie Lou Hamer, James Baldwin. There's a line in the book about Medgar Evers. I never would have survived without him. Mm. And that captures for me the sense of the young civil rights workers going in to Mississippi, the hardest state, the state that actually the Southern Christian Leadership Conference decided pretty much to avoid as being too hard, to which Bob Moses then said, well, if Mississippi is too hard for them, there's an opportunity for us. And they go in. Uh, it is really is a wonderful memoir of people trying to prove Amer- improve America when a lot of Americans didn't want it improved. Uh, one person that I was thinking about yesterday is Hank Thomas, who actually lives now here in Atlanta. Right. Mm-hmm. The enormous courage. It's one thing to take a beating for the moment. Mm-hmm. It's another thing to do what he does take a beating and come back a week later. He's right. on the freedom rides. He's in Anniston, Alabama. He gets off the bus. His lungs are full of black smoke from the burning foam rubber. A white man comes up to him and says, are you all right? And Thomas says, I, I think so. The man swings a baseball bat into his head. Mm-hmm. Hank Thomas recovers and a week later gets on another freedom ride bus. To the, the courage to know to do that when you know exactly what you're getting into, there is a special, extraordinary, I think, kind of dedication there. Finally, just one line I just wanted to read because I I just had underlined it and thought about it again when I came to it again. On page 166. And I think this captures a lot of what your father is talking about in the book. Life after Medgar, was killed felt like a series of things we did between tragedies. Mm. What a tragic view of life to have right. your life be what you do between enormously tragic events. It really just resonates. So thank you. And let's start getting into questioning each other. Yeah, for sure. Um, and for those who don't, that's the book, the movement made us, uh, it's about my dad and you, I mean, I can't explain it better than you, you just, you just did. So thank you for that. And, and this, um, and I felt the same that this would that they were two sides of a, of a very similar story. And I think, you know, I had a, a question I wanted to ask at first, but that but the, what you just did sort of made me go somewhere else with it, which is that like we're talking about two uh, your, your book is talking about two things that are extremely tragic at heart, like that we think about it. We think about, you know, race in America and war. Right. And that rarely when we talk about it, that they have that we could think of happy endings when we think about these things. Right. And 
I know at some point in, in writing this book that I've there was a long period of despair in how I thought about these things, mm-hmm. right? And it's easy, like it's very easy, I think, <clears throat> or easier to have written things that are full of despair. Your book could have been one of complete despair, right? And yet you choose to do something different, to make a hopeful book about what's possible in, in this country. How do you come to a place in this where you are so intentional? Because I think you have to be intentional to find hope. Like, how are you intentionally finding it for yourself and putting hope into the text like this? That's a good question. Uh, my point of departure is that war is a form of insanity. It's extremely mm-hmm. destructive, not just physically, but of the human spirit. Mm-hmm. Yet, I did find this a good war because it is human beings doing human things to try to make this country a better place. And fundamentally, the core demand of the civil rights movement was treat us like human beings. And by the way, let's all treat each other like human beings. Mm -hmm. And for me, that's rule one in life. You can never go wrong treating other people like human beings. For me, the departure though was my other books about war are really tragic. There's very little good you could say about the Iraq war. We Mm -hmm. went into a country on false premises. Uh, A lot of people died. I'm not sure what we get out of it. Afghanistan, likewise, we mucked around for 20 years and then walked away. This book was for me a good war, basically because at the core are these marvelous people, American heroes, who I think need to be better known. Uh, the names that I mentioned, Medgar Evers, Amzie Moore, Dave Dennis, Bob Moses, Fannie Lou Hamer, Diane Nash, these should be as familiar to every American as the generals of the Civil War are. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, This was an American Civil War over many of the same issues about, you know, what what are we as a country and how do we treat each other? So it it did feel good in that I kept on saying to myself, illuminate what they did Mm -hmm. and put them on the postage stamp. I want a postage stamp uh, issued of Fred Shuttlesworth. Right. Mm -hmm. Moonshiner turned minister, ferocious mm-hmm. guy, um, nonviolent when he needed to be, but there's that point in Birmingham when he's getting ready to slug Martin Luther King Jr. Mm-hmm. and Andy Young is ready to hold him back. Right. Uh, the, you know, just the guy, Fred Shuttlesworth, when he's called in by the Birmingham dominant caste structure, and they say, We're worried that Martin Luther King's coming to town. What can we do about mm-hmm. it? Mm-hmm. And he looks him over and he says, You know, I got bombed twice in this town. Church got bombed, house got bombed. None of you called me then. Mm-hmm. But now Martin Luther King's coming to town and you want some help. Now you call me. Uh, just the toughness, the individuality of these people, Septima Clark, older woman. Uh, mm-hmm. That is fundamentally uh, what I found inspiring about this. Think of, th- think of Hank Thomas, the guy mm-hmm. getting on the bus a week after taking that beating and getting almost burned to death. Uh, This really is unusual stories of great Americans that made it worthwhile for me Mm. to engage in the book, that really pulled me into it every day. My question for you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In your book, you mentioned Emmett Till. Mm -hmm. Emmett Till intrigues me because I think there is still very different senses in white America and black America about Mm -hmm. Emmett Till to remind people a 14 year old uh, black teenager murdered brutally lynched in Mm -hmm. Money, Mississippi in 1955, just after turning 14. It strikes me that in some ways the killing of Emmett Till lit the fuse Mm -hmm, for the mm -hmm. student part of the civil rights movement. I haven't seen this discussed much, but I wondered if if you have thoughts on it. The students in Nashville in 1960 in in South Carolina, North Carolina, who begin the Mm sit-ins, they were the same age as Emmett Till. Mm -hmm. They'd all looked at Ebony Magazine and seen those photographs and thought, 
that could be me. That mm -hmm. could have been me. Do you have that sense that Emmett Till is still kind of someone who the killing of Emmett Till really is an important factor in what happens five years later in the civil rights movement? Oh, absolutely. And I mean, I think, uh, you know, I think we frame what happened to Emmett Till and, and, and obviously in a lot of ways, rightfully so, like a, a, a terrible murder with a victim to it. Right. But the Emmett Till story is a heroic story from his mother. Right. Who took mm. this tragic moment, the worst moment of her life. Right. And turned it into something bigger than herself. Right. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I have not seen the Till movie that comes out Friday, but I think that that's what they're trying to do with that story is they're taking what she did. Right. Is repurpose this terrible thing into something that could change the country. Right. And so by her doing that, I definitely think because the, it, it turns this thing from the political to the at your front door type yeah. of deal. Right. And it also speaks what was unspoken, you know, um, as we mentioned in the book that, you know, from at my dad, my dad had was on a plantation at the time out in, in Shreveport and people would just disappear. Right. Like you, they would just be there one day and be, not be there the next. And so what Emmett Till did was he put a face on exactly what was happening to these people mm -hmm. sort of in the, in a very similar way of, um, you know, in Ferguson or, you know, um, in Minneapolis and, and George Floyd and all that, where, where we know police brutality happens. We know that people get killed by police, unarmed black people get killed by police. But now you have something that gives it texture, right, that you can feel it. Yeah. And for this to happen to people at their age, they understand that they are in a place where if it's if something bad can happen to you, then also you could be a part of something that rebuffs that. And two things really I, strike strike me about you saying this. Mm -hmm. First, the, the transformational response of Emmett Till's mother mm -hmm. is so consistent with a core principle of the civil rights movement to take negative energy and mm -hmm. make it something positive. Right. If you get bombed or attacked, you march the same mm -hmm. day. Mm -hmm. and send a message that you know this is is not tolerable the other thing it reminds me of is uh, in 1963 when james bevel uh, is trying to revive the birmingham campaign mm -hmm. and the adults of birmingham can't march they'll lose their jobs they know they'll be beaten in jail and so bevel gets out the kids to march some of them mm -hmm. as young as eight years old and swamps the jails with two thousand people and Attorney General Robert Kennedy chides Martin Luther King and James Bell for this. Mm -hmm. He says, I don't know if we want to get children involved in this, they could get hurt. Mm -hmm. And I think what every young black person thought was, dude, we're already getting hurt. Right. Mm -hmm. We know the true face of this system. Mm -hmm. Don't warn us that we might get hurt. And true enough, you know, a few months later, you get the, to me, one of the most tragic events in American history, the bombing of the 16th Street Church in Birmingham, right. killing four little girls. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one one of the things that, um, like, that this book does is it, it, it opens the synapses, right? Yeah. Is that, you know, it, it sort of, you have these things of war on one side and history, which you learn in history class, you have this movement stuff on the other side of your brain and they rarely intersect. And what you do is you, you know, create those, those wires and you create a space where we sort of see it for the first time. And, you know, obviously you, I mean, you, you open with, with Bevel and Sherman and their sort of connection and, and strategy connection and, and, um, and thoughts on, uh, and, you know, talk about that. But what was interesting you know, you came into this, obviously, as somebody who knows a lot about war, right? And the movement stuff, this book is revelatory a lot about movement stuff, but I'm curious about you. Like, what did you learn in the book that, that about the nature of war itself? Anything new that, that you know, about war itself? If anything, 
the striking thing to me, because this was a different war, a good war, mm. was that even a good war carries such cost, personal, emotional, psychological, physical, uh, the cost of the struggle. And that's kind of why I dwelled in the end of the book on the cost to your father. Mm -hmm. uh, there's that moment. Um, I can't remember what, I think it's, I can't remember whether it's in your book. I know it's in mm -hmm. my book. Mm -hmm. uh, he's in law school, he right. was checking out a book at the law school and he recognizes the woman at the circulation desk. Mm -hmm. And he asked somebody, and um, they say, yeah, uh, she works here on leave from the insane asylum where she mm -hmm. lives. Yeah. And he remembers, oh, she was the woman that the police in Vicksburg played Russian roulette with a pistol against her head. Right. And now, you know, and I think that weighed on him. Mm -hmm. One more uh, evidence of the cost. Uh, it's an odd, odd point where your book and my book again come together, talking right. about the cost of this. Uh, oddly enough, in both our books, we also talk about the cost to the children of the civil rights movement. Right, right. Mm -hmm. uh, question for you. How has your book been received by other children of civil rights leaders? Oh, uh, it's been, that's been probably the best part of how the book has been received is that you know, I knew that I, I don't know what I thought I was I was was going to come out of this. Like I knew I wanted I knew my dad's stories to be told. And I thought it was important that his story obviously be told and that, you know, I, I actually, you know, the point you made earlier about your book from the 30,000 feet in mind being in there. Like at, at first when I read as dad the stories, I did not do the 30,000 foot research. I just wanted to tell the story as somebody on a battlefield who you get told to go and do something and you're not totally sure the large ramifications of it. But I, when I, the things that I've been hearing the most is that a lot of the people in the movement and their children have been saying, we've been having the conversations we haven't had before mm -hmm. is that, you know, children of the movement saying, well, I did not. Well, one thing I learned is that i know more about my dad's movement stuff than a lot of kids in the movement know about their parents. Right. Um, because it's buried and hidden so deep. People have read my book and said, I didn't know my dad or my mom was in that. I didn't know my, they were doing this stuff. I didn't know, you know, like, the, you know, when you talk about um, the deacons for defense in Louisiana and different groups in Mississippi, and it's like, well, I had no clue. So they've sort of had those, those conversations with each other. Um, and that's been one of the sort of beautiful aspects of, um, what 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 folks have gotten from the book i think i like those unexpected responses mm -hmm. last night i was speaking at the atlanta historic center and as i was leaving afterwards a young black female security guard came up to me and said i'll walk you to the parking lot and i said no i'm fine mm -hmm. she said i'll walk you and as we got outside she turned and said my family's from selma mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I learned these stories from the elders on Sunday. We had to show that we heard them and understood them. Uh, the amount of history around us mm -hmm. still to be grasped and understood, first of all, is quite moving to me. Second of all, I think fundamentally it's important to gain control of the narrative. We are right. storytelling people and the stories we tell ourselves about who we are as a country. Uh, many of them false, mm -hmm. the lost cause, the glory of the Confederacy, that slavery was a benign institution. Mm -hmm. And it's important to grasp the narrative and pull it back and say, actually, you want to talk about history? Let's talk about real history and real facts. Mm -hmm. And this history is still uh, somewhat buried. I noticed, for example, your father, even trying, could not recall his time in solitary confinement. Right. Mm -hmm. Literally, it's a black hole. Right. There is still a bit of a, a black hole here. My own experience, my wife's best friend uh, was in Freedom Summer. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, I should you know, talk to her about it. I couldn't get anywhere with it. Yeah. Uh, uh -huh. You know, they've known each other what, 50 years. Right. And, no, just, you know, I, I just did a few things down there. I don't really have many memories. And I was like, mm -hmm. okay, <laughs> yeah. another time. Right. She liked the book. She actually, mm -hmm. when she read the book, she sent me a note saying, this is a sacred text. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
it resonated with her, but she wasn't ready to talk about some aspects of it. It's important, though, that people do talk about it because this generation is mm-hmm. leading the stage. Right. You know, in, in 25 years, there's hardly going to be a, a veteran of the civil rights movement around except a few kids mm-hmm. from Birmingham. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, when you talk about spending it um, for for this generation, which is something that's interesting to me, is that there's so much like the way that I, that we that my generation thinks about war itself, especially coming out of Afghanistan and you know Iraq, is the idea of a lot of the terms that you use in talking about movement work is something that I have always grown up to have negative connotations about, right? Mm-hmm. Like when we talk about invasions and we talk about occupations and things like that like that's what the bad guys do <laughs> you know like that's what that's what we you know that's what we did in these countries right and obviously you rethink of this as, as the good as good war so these things are are used for good good means so how how important is it or how are we you know have you thought about how do we make this language in a way that these future generations who are part like there's a you know, a natural connection of people who are part of these movements who are about, you know, demilitarization or about, mm-hmm. you know, not being part of this language. How do we sort of make sure that there is an understanding of the goodness of this kind of war so that there's not this recoiling from it? It's a good question. Um, I don't want to make war more acceptable, mm-hmm. but I do want to make nonviolent struggle. Mm-hmm. Right, uh, more focus, more, more of a central focus, and I think that's something that really is not taught at all. Right, even, mm-hmm. even in interviews on my book on this book tour, people have said, "Well, basically, they did passive resistance," and mm-hmm. I say, "No, right. Gandhi <laughs> hated the term passive resistance. He mm-hmm. rejected it. He said we are confrontational, nonviolent activists. We, the term they use in Hindu actually translates to clinging to the truth." Mm-hmm. I have this image of grabbing a hold of Bull Connor by the lapels and just not letting go. Mm-hmm. They slug you, you come back again the next day. Uh, Gandhi showed in one march, he had more people who could take a whipping with a lead-lined whip mm-hmm. than they had people willing to keep on whipping. Mm-hmm. Uh, nonviolence, I think, is so important because it's an effective method. This is a country that speaks violence fluently. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. They know how to respond, the power structures, uh, to a movement that uses violence. Mm-hmm. Come right in, you know, right. step mm-hmm. right up. When you use nonviolence, I think it was James Bevel who observed this, you're already one tactical step ahead of the other. Right, guy. right. Mm-hmm. He doesn't understand what you're doing, how you're doing it. They're constantly surprised, like James Lawson in Nashville. Mm-hmm. They arrest all the kids sitting at, at, a, at a lunch counter asking for service he waits 10 minutes and then sends in a second wave Mm -hmm. they arrest them he sends in a third wave the police at this point don't know what's going on he's thought he's out thought them so the preparation the training and the discipline the two words that kept on coming up you know reading transcripts even reading fbi wiretaps discipline and dignity Mm -hmm. are so effective especially in the nonviolent context I also think nonviolence is important to emphasize because if you want to bring along kind of the middle part of America, the, the, the people that Martin Luther King Jr. addresses so unhappily in the letter from the Birmingham jail, mm-hmm. that middle part of America that isn't sure it, it wants to support this, being nonviolent really catches their attention because it shows mm-hmm. the contrast with the attacker and it shows a force of will and human dignity taking Mm -hmm. the hit, overcoming the human instinct to fight or flee and not responding is so powerful. Mm -hmm. And remember also, at its best, America is built on the vote, and the vote Mm -hmm. is the basic form of nonviolent social change. Right. Right now, that that right is under attack, which leads me actually to a a thought I wanted to get in here. Mm -hmm. I see a direct connection between your father's work and the January 6th committee, Mm -hmm. a direct historical line. And in in some, it is this. Freedom Summer, led by Bob Moses and your father, changes 
the nature of voting in Mississippi. Before it, 7% of black adults in Mississippi could vote. By 1968, a few years later, 59% of black adults in Mississippi were registered to vote. Shortly after that point, a young man, Benny Thompson, gets elected to public office, then he gets elected to mayor a few years later, and then he gets elected to Congress. And today, he's leading the January 6th committee. So Freedom Summer expands American democracy, even if at the time they didn't feel they were succeeding. They did. Mm -hmm. One of the products, the beneficiaries of Freedom Summer, is now protecting American democracy as head of that committee. All right. The things that the civil rights movement did, the achievements, are still only coming into focus. Mm -hmm. Full appreciation of the civil rights movement is part of, I think, what you and I are both about in our books. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think I want to, the, the nonviolent thing is interesting about when you, when you say that about the hold it can have on so much of America, which is why it's so interesting that so much, that there's so much concerted effort in narrative making to create violence in these nonviolent spaces, even dating back to then, you know, they were say that um, civil rights folks were bombing their own churches to, you know, or if they you didn't march, you wouldn't be attacked. So the violence is right. Far, yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. So yeah. it's always trying to put the narrative of violence on there. So to take away that appeal to, to the, to the wider audience. Um, what do you, one thing, I mean, obviously, the book, uh, my book, the pivotal point in my dad's life is his speech at James Cheney's funeral on a chain turning point in, in the movement. And obviously, the, the this book has a lot of a lot about speeches and um, and the impact of speeches and 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 um, the movement, the change in the course of, of America. And I'm interested in this in in the sort of the the war parallel here because speeches play large parts in these and, and thinking about, you know, when I think about, you know, my dad's speech in 64 was mostly passion mm -hmm. and there, but there was a lot of speeches that were just, you know, I mean, obviously King speeches mm -hmm. with just like very precise political statements in them. And so can you just talk about the importance of speeches across these lines and um, how we look at them as political work, but also, you know, almost sometimes um directives and strategy and the way that they impact these wars your dad's speech is indeed striking i've watched the video of it it's scary mm -hmm. uh, this is a man deep tragic grief really at the end of his rope mm -hmm. uh, he is just carrying such a weight that when he says god damn your souls my yeah, you know, my hair stands on it Mm -hmm. It was not a typical, I think, civil rights speech, I think, but mm -hmm. really characterized the speeches of King and I think Bevel and others was how strategic they were. The civil rights movement was better at strategy than the U.S. military is. Mm -hmm. They knew what their goals were. They had thought through how to achieve them. And they knew what the end state should be, what they wanted when this was all over. Mm -hmm. uh, I always love what Diane Nash said in Nashville. We begin by asking who we are. Mm -hmm. They define themselves as people who will no longer tolerate segregation. That act of self-definition, first of all, defining yourself, not letting somebody else define who you are, is liberating. Mm -hmm. But it also is a strategic act because once you say we are people who will no longer live with segregation, tactics flow from that. That means, mm -hmm. as she put it, yeah, sure, white people might kill us, but that's on them. That's not on us. Right. Uh -huh. We just don't live with it anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, so that leads to tactics like we will get on buses knowing we might be killed. Mm -hmm. The Kennedy administration officials called Diane Nash and say, that bus is going to be burned tomorrow. She said, we got that. Mm -hmm. uh, before, you, before we allow a student volunteer on the bus, they have to write a last letter to their parents and sign a last will and testament. Mm -hmm. The Kennedy people said, no, no, you're going to get killed. She said, we got that. Finally, the attorney general says, yells, who the hell is Diane Nash? The answer is, she's a 20-year-old college dropout living in the YWCA in Nashville, and she's outplaying you politically. 
Mm -hmm. So they always had strategy in their speeches. This is striking, especially of Dr. King from his very first speech at the beginning of the Montgomery bus boycott. He thinks strategically. His speeches begin by saying, this is who we are, self-definition. Mm -hmm. This is what we want. This is how we intend to get it. This is what we hope to see as the end state. It's most striking in 63. You have two visions of America presented that year. In Birmingham, Bull Connor says, I will preserve the existing structure by turning police dogs and fire hoses on children as young as eight years old. Mm -hmm. These fire hoses are so powerful, they'll strip bark off a tree on doing it. Fast forward to August 63, Martin Luther King at the end of the March on Washington, biggest demonstration in American history, biggest interracial event in American history. Not a single arrest, not a single act of violence. Presents his vision, which is basically, I have a dream that we could treat each other with dignity and respect and live peacefully together with equal justice under the law. And the American people say, oh, that's interesting. This is sort of the presentation of the civil rights movement to white America. They haven't really mm -hmm. been paying attention until then. The white media didn't cover King's speeches until then. And white America looks and says, okay, we got Bull Connor's vision of America. It's a nightmare. Mm -hmm. And we got this Martin Luther King guy. We're going with King. Right. So I think the speeches uh, were striking to me in that they always were fit inside the strategy. They led to tactics, yet they also were quite effective in achieving goals, mm. as the I Have a Dream speech did. One final thought on speeches. They were so powerful in changing how black Southerners looked at themselves. Mm -hmm. One of the things they did in training in Selma was to say, the sheriff is not coming after you. You are coming after the sheriff. Mm -hmm. Turning it around. An example of this is James Bevel, who I mentioned. Bevel is in uh, South Georgia on a Sunday, guest minister, giving a sermon in a small rural church. And in the middle of his sermon, the local sheriff, probably having heard that Bevel was speaking, speaking that day, walks into the church, puffing on a cigar. Mm. Just so disrespectful in the middle right. of the church. Mm. Bevel doesn't miss a beat. He says, you know, the devil's going to come after you people. Sometimes you'll have a little forked tail. Sometimes you'll have a pitchfork. And sometimes you'll be puffing on a cigar. The whole church laughs at the sheriff who then turns on his heel and walks out. Think mm -hmm. of how that changes the power dynamic right there. One of the guys who had made himself a figure of fear mm -hmm. suddenly is laughed out of church. Well, that night, of course, the system responds. The church is burned down. Mm -hmm. Bevel says, all I'm doing is showing you the face of the system. Right. Their speeches are so good. Actually, there was a collection I just came across when I was working on the book, I'd never heard of it before, uh, Sermons of the Civil Rights Movement. Mm -hmm. it, was, it, it was quite moving to read the whole thing. And again and again, how good they were at strategy and discipline. Mm -hmm. I want to um, let everybody know we're going to get to questions in a second. You had one more one more question? or No, I think we should probably get to the Q&A. Okay, yeah. Um, let's see. Um all right, this is a good um, What lessons have you learned from writing and studying history for so many years that you wish more people knew about? I'd like to hear your answer to this. Um, I think fundamentally is that there is real history out there. There mm -hmm. are real facts, uh, but you have to work to learn the history. Mm -hmm. uh, and as James Baldwin said, this country cannot move forward until we are truthful with ourselves. Mm -hmm. So learning the history, reading the history, understanding it is part of moving the country forward. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, I think I think for me is that is how much stuff is how much stuff we have seen before yeah. and how much stuff that people have already 
that like the foundation for change has already been laid. You know, I think there's a lot of times, this is one of the things I wanted to do with the books. A lot of times that people feel, you know, I, it was written in, in, in the midst of, of Trumpism. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and Trump and, and a, a lot of it was written in the middle of 2020. There's pandemics, there's George Floyd, there's like everything feels. And so, you know, you do feel pretty hopeless trying to fight against that. But history sort of gives you comfort in knowing that there have been people who are like who have been in your position doing that sort of fighting and that the tactics of, you know, you said you said the um, civil rights movement is better strategist than than the U.S. government that also like white supremacy and this country, for the most part, in its oppression is very uncreative, you know. Um, they will well, use hell, the same violence had over. worked for 300 years. Right. right. Why give up the proven system? And that's right. not the problem. The, the, the white power structure of the South was like a dinosaur, really big and powerful, mm. but with a tiny brain, because they didn't need right. it. Right. And suddenly yeah. they needed it. And it, as you indicated, they didn't know how to think or respond. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, they hadn't been, you know, like, I mean, and that's one of the things that that's, I love about the book is that it highlights and one of the things I want to do is it highlights ingenuity, you know, which is which is something that I think we strip a lot of movement folks as people who are just trying to survive, trying to figure things out. But there was a lot of real ingenuity, I think, partially because they were not dealing with a framework like when you have when all the when people are just changing the rules whenever they feel like it. And you look at things like not bound by by pretending to be part of the law, you can just play with play a different game. You know, like you've got chess pieces, you can move them wherever you sort of want and figure something out, you know. But they also constantly would say, What did Gandhi do in this situation? Right. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, that they had this playbook they had ex- many of them had studied mm-hmm. and said, you know, one of you know, Gandhi had all these lessons. They had Gandhi actually had a manual for nonviolence. Mm-hmm. And there were also principles that they had distilled. One thing Gandhi writes that struck me, the more likelihood that violence will be used against you, the more important it is to have trained and disciplined marchers. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So his most famous march is the Salt March to the Sea. Mm -hmm. And one thing people have heard about Gandhi is he led a march to the sea. What people forget is there were only 38 marchers. Mm -hmm. He took his 38 best trained, best disciplined, most dedicated people they marched to the sea. Now they were greeted by crowds of 50,000 in every town. Mm-hmm. But it was a small, very powerful group. Uh, I have a similar thought listening to you is if you think things are bad today, look at 1954, the Civil Rights Movement. Uh, mm-hmm. You're considering the Montgomery bus boycott. The South doesn't obey federal law. The white power structure has all federal offices, I mean, all offices political, local, national. They own security, police, and everything else. They have the banks. They have the newspapers. Um, What they don't have is a thoughtful consideration of the situation. Mm -hmm. It's a great vulnerability. It's one reason I think the civil rights movement was able to succeed is it is so off the screen, so Mm -hmm. unknown to the white power structure that it constantly is able to outplay it. It was riddled with informers, but people mm-hmm. you know, the police were constantly sending in informers. I think you quote your father was saying there was at least one informer in every civil rights me- meeting I was ever in. Right. Yet they overcame that again and again and, and didn't let it get in their way. They had almost no physical resources. They had no money. Mm-hmm. They had no assets. Mm-hmm. So to start from that and in 10 years radically change America, it's an enormous achievement. Uh, right. We are in a better position today to bring about social change. The second lesson I take away from all that then is something that Erica Chenoweth at Harvard has written about mm-hmm. in her studies of nonviolence. She concludes nonviolent movements are about twice as likely to succeed as violent movements. Mm-hmm. She also says that authoritarian regimes, and here I'm talking about Putin's Russia mm-hmm. or Iran today, authoritarian regimes are always weaker than they appear to be. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that is something I think we can draw solace and inspiration from. Sometimes the system will crack because it's mm-hmm. so brutal. 
Oh, let's see. Did okay. Here's uh, did our current political climate inspire you to write about the civil rights movement? Yeah, good question. Very much. Um, mm. I would say my this book and my previous two together, three books, are all trying to approach our problems as a country today from different angles. The first book I'm talking about is Churchill and Orwell, which is how the left and the right responded in the 1930s to fascism on the right and totalitarianism on the left. And one of the things you see is the people of principle police their own sides. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't say, okay, well, he's on my side, so I won't criticize him. If they think something is morally wrong, they say so, Churchill and Orwell. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make them a lot of friends in their mm -hmm. own movements, but in the long run, it's the right thing to do. It makes your movement stronger. Mm -hmm. The next book I wrote, First Principles, was, okay, what is this country? I actually mm -hmm. began it the day that Trump was elected because mm -hmm. I couldn't believe it. What happened here? Uh, what is this country? What is this supposed to be? And I went back to the first principles of the country mm -hmm. and basically concluded we've always had this dynamic in America. We have vaulting ambitions and aspirations, and we sometimes have brutal realities. Mm -hmm. We need to keep both in mind and deal with both as we go forward. Oh, uh, what is the most uh political what is the most fulfilling part of being a journalist slash writer was the most challenging part i'm gonna kick that over to you you're more like a journalist than i am <laughs> um i think the most fulfilling part is is that rare occasion we feel like you've changed something or you've done something that is um made a difference you know that's that's extremely um important to me you feel like i've told a story of somebody whose story needs to be told, um, spoken for the voiceless or whatever, you know, you want to call them. I think that's been important. I think what's, what's challenging is, uh, well, right now, the way that journalism itself has shifted with the country, you know, and that what we consider quote unquote objective leans further towards wherever, um, you know, the majority of the country may be heading towards or a large swath of the country or even, 90, or even a minority of the country is heading. And so <clears throat> the feeling of what is factual, you know, I, I tell, you know, my when I was teaching, I would tell my students, like, if, you know, it's like if you were in 1850 and you wrote an op-ed that said slavery, if you wrote that slavery is bad, it'd be an op-ed, you know? Yeah. And, you know, it's just like that should not, you know, there should be, and that's what makes it challenging is that they we talk about things that and that fact that should be factually accepted based on us as human beings and that um gets snuffed out by the idea that it's not journalistic when you know those practices have never sort of been um in favor of people who necessarily look look like me or have the same sort of backgrounds as i do george orwell wrote something about that he said the constant task is to see what is in front of your own eyes. Mm. Unfortunately, that's the most difficult of task. Right. But, you know, we really don't even know what's going on until later when we mm -hmm. look back. Uh, the fun of journalism to me is trying to figure out even remotely accurately what is happening. Right. But I have no idea, for example, how the war in Ukraine is going to turn out. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. I'm fascinated by what's happening there. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't want to cover it, by the way, as an old war correspondent. Um, it just feels very dangerous to me. Yeah that, yeah. that whole battlefield, the attitude of the Russian soldiers, they're not going to respect your First Amendment rights if they capture you on the battlefield. Mm -hmm. um, no, that's, that's, yeah, that's, I mean, I can't, um, war correspondence is, I mean, that just seems that's just a, a terrifying thing, especially being being out there um, in in a place where or being in places where that is a pun, you know, a deadly thing to, to, to choose to do, you know, to tell the it's truth. It's hugely stressful. Um, yeah. A lot of people I know um, come back from Iraq or Afghanistan, never really completely whole again. Mm -hmm. uh, friends of mine have died, I think, really from the stress. Anthony mm -hmm. Shadid, a terrific reporter, 
died, I think, at the age of 49, mm -hmm. supposedly from an asthma attack, but I think an asthma attack and a heart attack on the Syrian-Turkish border as he was going on a reporting trip. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it really is hard war correspondence, and people are not the better for it when they come right. out the other side. It's funny, though. You know what war correspondents talk about? Technology. Oh, really? <laughs> when you're sitting around talking, people, they, nobody wants to hear heroic stories. Mm -hmm. Nobody really talks the politics of it. Like, hey, have you tried the new SAB 1500, <laughs> uh, um, you know, satellite? You know, what baud rate are you getting? Well, have you tried mm -hmm. pointing it to the southeast at sunset? Because there you can pick up the satellites much better. Uh, constantly like that. Um, mm -hmm. A war correspondent, correspondent once said to me, the difference in war correspondence is that getting the story is relatively easy. Combat is mm -hmm. easy to write. So that's 30% of the work. Mm. Another thirty percent is getting the story back to your boss. Right. Mm. The last ten percent is staying alive, mm. yeah. which are not considerations for most journalists most of the time. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, and now, I mean, now, and the part of the book that I mean, towards the end is the that legacy that PTSD, the physical ramifications. I kept I kept thinking about um, George Raymond, who was down in. Uh, spent a lot. Was in Mississippi. It was one of the original Freedom Riders. Seventeen when he did that. Was in Canton and all those places. And he died. I think thirty years old from heart failure. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Uh, and that's just that's all through the movement through those through those those books. And that's you know, in particular um, even more than the average infantry soldier, mm -hmm. the constant stress of being behind enemy lines. Mm -hmm. Again, it reminded me of a history I read once of the French resistance, who uh, most of them were actually quite young. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them died young in their 30s and 40s. They right. were just used up. Their body was used up, the stress on the heart. And then a lot of them also never could quite let go of the thrill of the time. Mm -hmm. Life mm -hmm. was always a little bit duller afterwards. Right. But it's like when your father steps through the screen of accepting that he might die today. It's mm -hmm. kind of living in a div div divine state. Right. Mm -hmm. But once man is not meant to live in a divine state, right. there's the reason the Greek gods put a veil over the faces of the gods. I mean, the Greek statues had, mm -hmm. of the gods had veils over their faces because man's not supposed to see that. Once right. you have looked upon the divine, everyday life can seem mighty dull. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, he said he didn't take a vacation the whole time. You know, I mean, I mean when you're living in, you well, know, he went on I, vacation that, in New York City and wound up. In right. The that, <laughs> right. Yeah, that was his one vacation that ended up that ended up poorly. But like, you know, you you that was one thing we we talked about. And I think he sort of realized in the book that there was no home base for yeah. them. You know, there was no all right, We've done our battle. Mm -hmm. We retreat to yeah. our camp. You know that there was none of that. You know, Mega was shot in his house. You know, there was no um, ability to find to have that even that night of sleeping where you're sleeping and feeling relatively safe. You were in the midst of that for nonstop for the the formative years of your life, really. You know, I can't remember if it's in your book. I know I mentioned it in mine in '64. Amzie Moore is that how you pronounce his first name? Amzie. Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Amzie Moore, very credible comes and I think tells Bob Moses and your father uh, that he has learned and believes it, that the Klan plans to kill Amzie Moore, Dave Dennis, Bob Moses, Fannie Lou Hamer, and that must have been 63 because Medgar Evers was on the list, mm -hmm. early 63 or something. Uh, they were serious. I think they were going right. to do it. I mm -hmm. don't understand how Amzie Moore survived basically mm -hmm. two decades. Right of being a resistance member behind enemy lines. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, I mean, yeah. I mean, and that's every day, you know, I was just every day. And, yeah. um, and the, I mean, I think I know that, that I don't even know. I know, I know that part wasn't the book. I don't even know if dad remembers that because there were times where I, where I'll ask him about that. And he just said, it was just constant. You just sort of like yeah. that, that was, that might've been a Tuesday for him, <laughs> you know, where you hear yeah. that stuff and that's just, that's just where it is. You just sort of wear it like an extra skin of knowing that. Well, it's like the time in, in your book when um these kids come back 
shaking and there's bullet holes right, right. in the car. Mm-hmm. And he's totally unsympathetic. He says, well, well where's the affidavit? Right, well, right. We got shot at. He says, well, get, here's the keys to another car. Get the damn yeah. affidavit. Right. It's <laughs> right. cold. But yeah, yeah. it also is pointing to discipline. Now, you saw this again mm-hmm. and again in good leadership. Um, Ivan Donaldson, I remember, did something similar. Guy comes in and says, I just got arrested by the sheriff. And he starts telling the story. And Donaldson interrupts and says, you go back out there. People mm-hmm. in the town need to see. You got arrested. You're out. And you're back doing the job. Right. Yeah. Discipline and dignity. Me, uh, I don't think, I don't know if we're going to get to all these questions. Let's see. Um, let's see. Uh, is the formulation of good war your own? And is it informed at all by the intellectual and military tradition internationally of just war? Not really, because just war theory, as I understand it, is about violence upon violence. Mm-hmm. This is about uh, a nonviolent movement, which I don't think um, has really been explored well by scholars until recently. Mm-hmm. I mentioned Erica Chenoweth. She's written two very good books on the, the uses of nonviolence, how it works, why it works. Uh, I think there's a real future in it, especially mm-hmm. because the state increasingly the surveillance state, all seeing, um, can see and know, we see this especially in China, you have to figure out ways to step outside the state's intellectual apparatus. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think nonviolence is the root to that. Um, Let's see. Um, Do you think young people in this generation find active nonviolence futile? I think they might. And I think that's partly because the civil rights movement has not been taught well in our schools. And I think one reason that the civil rights movement has not been taught well in our schools is a big chunk of the country doesn't want it taught well in our schools. Mm -hmm. Uh, There is a lot you could learn here about how to change America. That's Mm -hmm. dangerous stuff. This is always one reason you should read the books they tell you not to read. Mm -hmm. The nonviolent movement is quite powerful, but they won't tell you that. You're going to have to find out for yourself. Thank you guys so much for such a, a great substantive conversation. It was, it was just such a pleasure to have you guys. As uh, oh, Thank you. I enjoyed it enormously. We should do this once a week. Right, yes. yeah. <laughs> we just hang out. <laughs> yeah. Thank you to all our independent books, to partners, and to Miami Book Fair. And to all of you in the audience for watching and reading and for posting questions in the chat. Um, Again, I want to say I hope you'll support Thomas and independent bookstores by ordering your copy of Waging a Good War at the link on the bottom of your screen or by popping into one of our stores in Miami. And don't forget this book also. (laughs) Yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Good night, all. Thank you. All right. Good night, guys. Thanks again. Okay.